welcome to another episode of Occupy Brooklyn TV. I'm Atik Zabinski. And I'm Kitana Andrews. Here are this week's top stories. Striking hot and crusty workers claim victory. Civil disobedience brings a temporary halt to Florida's dirtiest power plant and to the construction on the New York, New Jersey fracked gas pipeline. The New York DA gets over 2,000 signatures on a petition on behalf of railroaded cop watcher Jazz Hayden. Looking ahead to the anniversary celebrations of Occupy Wall Street, we'll interview OWS media maven Priscilla Grimm. See how the occupied kitchen prepares to again feed thousands and see how occupiers are trying to avoid becoming victims of police violence. On Saturday, September 8th, the union workers who had occupied their workplace at the Manhattan Upper East Side Hot and Krusty signed an agreement with the owner, private equity investor Mark Sampson, in what is being hailed as a remarkable victory for workers. Workers formed the Hot and Krusty Workers Association, an independent union, and in collaboration with their lawyers, successfully negotiated for improved pay and working conditions and to have the agreement apply to future employees. Last fall, after battling for over a year, some of them visited Occupy Wall Street and became acquainted with the Laundry Workers Center, a volunteer group providing guidance and support for worker organizing. Through translators, the workers, many of whom are undocumented, reported receiving less than minimum wage and working up to 10 hours a day, 360 days a year. This prompted Associated Lawyers to file with the New York State Labor Board against Samson's store. Workers themselves responded creatively by utilizing a variety of tactics including pickets and a workplace occupation that ended in arrests. But most notably, after Samson closed the store and locked out the workers, they opened a worker justice cafe on the sidewalk outside serving coffee and donuts to the regular hot and crusty patrons. On August 30th, on the occasion of the Republican National Convention in Tampa, Florida, Occupy and Earth First joined forces to shut down Big Bend Power Station. Besides being Florida's dirtiest power plant, Big Bend was targeted because of Tampa Electric's funding of the Republican Convention. Over 300 people were present for the shutdown, which lasted several hours. It ended in the arrest of seven. After negotiations with the Tampa Police Department, all were released. Civil disobedience, nonviolent, direct actions, is a completely peaceful demonstration. Uh, Earth First specializes in tactics such as lockdowns. Right here in the center, the, all the riot cops that have come out in crazy amount of numbers. Um, they're right now taking apart lock boxes. And our, our friends have been locked down. We have three locked down here. We have three up the road. And earlier, we had a, a, a coal truck stopped in the road. And somebody climbed on top. Lock, you locked their deck to the top. And they had, we had one of our banners on it. When we came up here to show solidarity with the people of Tampa Bay, we wanted to directly find um, a key contributor to the pollutants of their air and water. So Tico here, they're, they're, they're the single most uh, dirtiest coal brain power plant in the state of Florida and a contributor to the Republican National Convention. The police have agreed that they will be releasing everyone over here. That they will be releasing everyone over here. Oh! On one condition. On one condition. When the bus comes down this street. When the bus, bus comes down this street. Everyone gets on the bus. Everyone gets on the bus. And we leave the area. And we leave the area. On Thursday, September 6th, Construction on the Spectra Fracked Gas Pipeline in Manhattan's Greenwich Village was halted for several hours when three women put their bodies on the line and sat down in the way of a backhoe. Relations with workers as well as with police officers remained cordial as the women chose to be arrested rather than disperse. They were released again within two hours. Children! 
And his children will be exposed. Will be exposed to this radioactive. To this radioactive. Carcinogenic. Move back. On the following Sunday, activists returned to the site, staging a children-friendly picnic protest by the playground the potentially explosive pipeline is designed to pass by. Mike check! Mike check! Mike check! Mike check! I want to thank you all! I want to thank you all! For coming down here! For coming down here! For several years, 71-year-old activist Joseph Jazz Hayden has been monitoring and filming the many illegal race-based stop and frisks that police have been conducting throughout Harlem. Published on his site, allthingsharlem.com, Hayden's videos were widely seen by the general public and reported by news organizations such as the New York Times, NY1, Channel 7 Eyewitness News, and other mainstream outlets. In December 2011, Hayden became a victim of the very practices he has been working to end. Hayden was stopped while driving and his car illegally searched by cops he had filmed only a few months prior. The police found a pocket knife and a mini replica baseball bat and charged him with two counts of criminal possession of a weapon in the third degree, a charge punishable with two to seven years in prison apiece. Last week, protesters gathered in front of the district attorney's office of New York while activists King Downing, a lawyer, and Johanna Fernandez, a professor, delivered petitions of over 2,000 signatures, as well as letters urging district attorney Cyrus Vance to drop the charges. happened upstairs, and I'd like to preface these remarks by saying that I think it's ironic that Jazz Hayden interviewed uh, Cyrus Vance right before Cyrus Vance was elected. When Cyrus Vance was elected, he believed in democracy and he was open to meeting with people from the community today however that we are trying to expose the violations in jazz hayden's case the same person who interviewed vance and to whom vance said that he would stand up for equality and justice and against the racial profiling of the police in this city a overwhelmingly large percentage of the people charged are people of color, African American and Latino. I'd like to make sure as a DA's office that I can say, uh, we can't tell the police who to arrest and not to arrest, but that when it comes to us, we are not making charging decisions that are biased in any way. When representatives of the community and Jazz Hayden go to speak to Vance, uh, Cyrus Vance, we get the we were sent to the property release window. Oh, no. And the motion window. And, and, the, motion and, the, motion win window. and the motion window and the decline to prosecute window on the seventh floor. The DA's office is on the sixth floor. And guess what? There's absolutely no access to the sixth floor without an escort. So essentially, we've spent the last time Assemblyman Keith Wright, that we are representing uh, members of the community, religious.
religious leaders that we want to essentially uphold our rights to protest, to speak our minds, and to expose injustice. What's going to happen is that someone by the name of Kirsto Hylas, uh, who's a paralegal, is going to come down to accept our letters and our over 2,000 petitions. So I want us to go home tonight and question this thing we call democracy in the United States. We have absolutely no access to the people who are legislating over our lives, sending our people uh, to prison. They will not talk to us. So that's what's happened over the last hour. They will not talk to us. We are not important enough at this particular moment for them to talk to us. But come election time, they'll be clamoring at our doors. Yep. On the first day after Occupy Wall Street began last September, the question arose, how do you feed a movement? A group of people answered in the most fundamental way, with bagels and peanut butter, and the OWS Kitchen Working Group was born. In the days of the occupation of Zuccotti Park, hundreds volunteered to help prepare and serve food. Additionally, contributions came in a steady stream of fresh produce, food products, and cash donations, supplemented by pizza and restaurant delivery. Next came the help of Liberty Cafe, a food pantry in East New York, Brooklyn, offering the use of their cooking facilities. The OWS Kitchen Working Group, which became known simply as Kitchen, served up to 4,000 people a day and became the largest source of free food in New York City. Persevering even after the eviction of protesters from Liberty Square, Kitchen maintained a presence for the hungry in various public locations such as Union Square and the steps of Federal Hall and regularly fed the working groups of Occupy Wall Street as they continued meeting in the atrium of 60 Wall Street, a privately owned public space. Continually stretched thin, Kitchen continued preparing meals through the OWS May Day celebrations. And after May Day, exhausted but not finished, Kitchen scaled back to simple food distribution such as fruit and energy bars. Kitchen is now gearing up to feed the thousands expected to flock to New York City for S17, the one-year anniversary of Occupy Wall Street. How will this happen? We spoke with Ethan Murphy, a prominent Kitchen member, to find out. Saturday and Sunday are going to be days of education and training and we'll be serving to um, the pop-up occupation in Washington Square Park and at, at the concert in uh, Foley Park. So we'll be bringing food to the masses assembled for these events. Uh, lunches will be served sort of as a um, handheld meal, sandwiches, wraps, uh, fresh fruit, uh, things of that nature that people can take with them as they're going throughout their day. And dinner will be served more as a, a communal, um, sit-down, shareable meal where we can all discuss the issues that brought us together. Especially on Monday where um, all the action is going to be surrounding uh, Wall Street. We want the people to be well nourished while they're participating in these events. So uh, we're working closely with people delivering on bicycles or um, carrying carts and, and handing out food. And it's, you know, handing out food to the whole community, not just OWS. Um, leading up to S17, a lot of the farms have reached out to us, the Occupied Farms and Feed the Movement. Um, we've had people from Food Not Bombs reach out to us. So we have some interest in providing uh, donations. Um, we're working to receive all those this week and start production on Wednesday uh, to serve Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Um, we're also doing some fundraising to try to supplement uh, the donations with all of the uh, materials we'll need to actually do the service. All of the, um, you know, plates and uh, hotel pans and the things that we're going to require to actually transport the food. We are accepting donations uh, both in food uh, and supplies, also with uh, money donations which can go to the Action Resource Fund who's been the 
primary fundraiser for this S17 event. And we're trying to raise about $10,000 to do it. 9,000 meals, $10,000, it's about $1.33 a meal. So what we're working for in the future is to build a nonprofit community center that will be that will be operated like a restaurant on a donation basis. Um, full service, um, event space, to be sort of a incubator for community involvement uh, and hopefully, you know, change the way that um, the, the food industry serves the communities and actually encourages, you know, a more um, participatory model. The restaurant will definitely be um, a space with large communal tables, also with um, rooms for meetings and maybe uh, presentations. Um, so yes, it won't be just a like sit down, have your meal and leave type of restaurant. It'll be more of a, a community-based um, town hall. Yeah, that's really interesting how he wants to keep this going even past Occupy Wall Street and take it to the community. And, and use it as the basis for community building, which has already been demonstrated to be very effective. Exactly. I mean, the way to get people together is definitely food. Churches use it and uh, community centers use it. It's a great way to get people to show up. And then that's a great way to get people talking, too. And the model that it presents of, of just giving, giving food away and, and just trusting that there will be food tomorrow is just the complete opposite of the ethos of the capital system that we're in. I think it served very well to just viscerally demonstrate the idea that another world is possible. It was incredibly beautiful, and I've, I heard the kitchen called the heart of Occupy a few times, and in many ways it was. It definitely was. They definitely um, took care of all those people in a very positive way. It was really great. You got to keep people fed, and that's how they're able to stick out there, stick it out, out there when, when um, you know, the weather was getting worse and people were still out there in their tents and they're still having food and no one was messing with it either, which was great because that's kind of Everybody tough in New York. Respected kitchen. Exactly, exactly. Nobody Everyone respected the kitchen. <laughs> Even the police seat respected at least. They went the they went to the library. The police run around. Exactly. Get they wanted some free pizza too. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> they didn't respect the library as much, but at least they respected the food. <laughs> well, different levels of appreciation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Occupiers aren't the only ones preparing for S-17. NYPD has been recorded doing drills that appear to be preparations for mass arrests. It was here under the FDR Drive between the Brooklyn and Manhattan bridges where last November 14th police in riot gear practiced for the eviction of Zuccotti Park they would carry out the following night. This stack of concrete barriers on the edge of Zuccotti Park is one of several signs of a heightened police presence in the area. Will S-17 be another spectacle of police violence? A team of occupiers has circulated an online petition telling Mayor Bloomberg to respect occupiers' right to peaceably assemble. A link to the petition accompanies this video on the YouTube channel of S-17. This weekend, a few troublemakers turned a peaceful protest against Wall Street greed into a violent burst of chaos. The troublemakers carried pepper spray and guns and were wearing badges. To crush dissent. Please, please, please. When they're arresting people for using banners. When they're arresting people for using banners. Arresting people for mic checking in a train station. Arresting, arresting people for mic checking in a train station. For trying to use a sidewalk. Trying to use a sidewalk. None of these things have to do with public safety. None of these things have to do with public safety. They're about freedom of speech. They're about freedom of speech. Somewhere I read, 
of the freedom of assembly, somewhere I read, of the freedom of speech, somewhere I read, of the freedom of press, somewhere I read, that the greatness of America is the right to protest far right. Priscilla Grimm has been deeply involved in the media aspect of Occupy Wall Street from its very beginning. Dan Rather once described her as the real moving force behind Occupy Wall Street and even went so far as to allege that she runs the movement from her living room computer. Although Rather's exaggerated claim earned him much scorn, no one can deny that Grimm has been very influential in the movement. We sat down with Grimm and discussed her work as 17 and the nature of the Occupy movement. Here are a few minutes from that interview. I'm the director of the organization, one of the directors on the organization that we founded, the Occupy Solidarity Network, which we founded to both support the team that runs OccupyWallaceT.org, as well as raise money for direct political action um, in any political action that supports the mission of the Occupy movement, which is loosely to, you know, seed corporate control of our governments. We support a lot of media efforts. So we're supporting um, We Are the 99% uh, Tumblr blog. Uh, we support the website OccupyWallaceT.org. Um, we also are providing um, promotional support for the upcoming one year anniversary of September 17th. Um, we also uh, support like um, one of the biggest Twitter handles um, for the movement uh, at Occupy Wallace T. It, it's a team of people who don't want to be in charge of anything, right? And so what a lot of us wind up doing on the team is we all go out and um, work with different parts of the movement. And in our working with different parts of the movement just means that we're listening just means that we're reading what people are posting, we're listening at meetings, we're listening to hear what are the big ideas that are coming out that are resonating amongst lots of different communities and not just with one particular group. And then we bring all those ideas back to our group and we say this is what we're seeing here, this is what we're seeing there, so what should we actually support and that's how those decisions are made. Um, you know, we don't really come up with a lot of our own messaging at all. Um, recently, we, you know, we really try to just amplify what's coming out of the movement. That's really our job, amplification. And, um, you know, any movement uh, piece of media, if it's doing its job correctly, is going to do that and is not going to lead people into what a cadre of editors feel that they should be, you know, paying attention to or considering. Everything that we do is to promote direct action in the streets. One of the things that we will not support ever is, you know, petition drives, electronic petitions, Anything that starts with petition basically just gets laughed at by the group. If you really want to change the world today, you need to go out in the streets because the culture in which we live, in the United States particularly, is very comfortable with us sitting behind screens and being mediated in that way. And our mission is to drive people from that mediation into the street and into demanding what they need to have to be provided for them. Well, right now we're in a huge outreach mode for um, September 17th to get people out to the financial district on September 17th. And the great thing about the financial district is because it's filled with these very confusing streets and alleyways and all you have to do is keep moving and you're not going to be arrested. Um, all you have to do is keep moving. And the, the other thing that's kind of genius about it is because as most of New York is, it's mixed residential and um, business. So they're never going to use gas on protesters in New York City. They can't. Is so, the goal for S17 only to disrupt the financial district for that day or for a few days? Or is there um, something beyond that, that as well, far as Well, I mean, the dream is to shut it down, right? 
Uh, but we don't, we're not going to know until that day if enough people are going to show up to do that. So we can only hope and keep doing our outreach as best as we can and providing tools for people to get here. Would you say that shutting down Wall Street was the original goal of the occupation as well? You know, it's funny because we didn't even know people, <laughs> people were going to stay. That's our show. Thanks for watching. Yeah, but don't wait till next week to get in touch. Give us a call and send us an email. Let us know what you think of the show, if you'd like us to do anything different. And if you'd like to participate, we'd like your help. So give a call at 646-580-8446 or send an email at info at occupypublicaccesstv.com. See you next week.